Hello, welcome. Welcome to Southwestern College. Welcome to the 2018-2019 Smith-Wilson Lecture. Uh, first of all, we want to thank the Smith-Wilson family for uh, continuing to endow this, uh, this lecture for us. It's a lecture in religious and moral education. And we've had quite uh, some great speakers in the past years. Um, and then we're going to have a, a great talk today. I also want to thank um, Union Theological Seminary. I work with a lot of different schools and universities and colleges. They have been absolutely wonderful to work with. They actually answer emails. Isn't that a novel idea? And they answer within 24 hours. So good. But yeah, they've been a joy to work with. Um, I'm going to hand things over to um, Dr. President Andrews to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon. A highly respected scholar and public intellectual, it's my honor to introduce the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones, 16th President of the Historic Union Theological Seminary in Manhattan, New York. She is the first woman to head the 182-year-old institution. Dr. Jones also occupies the Johnston Family Chair for Religion and Democracy at Union, and prior to her service at Union, she served 17 years at Yale University, where she was the Titus Street Professor of Theology at the Divinity School, as well as the Chair of the University's Program in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. She's published three books, John Calvin and the Rhetoric of Piety, Feminist Theory and Christian Theology, and Trauma and Grace. She has a new book being released later this year, as I understand, Call It Grace, Finding Meaning in a Fractured World. An Oklahoma native with her father in attendance and an undergraduate degree from the University of Oklahoma, we Kansas, for so many reasons, are happy and honored and privileged to hear her speak today on the question, what is truth? Please join me in welcoming to Southwestern College the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be here in Kansas, in Winfield, at Southwestern. The outstanding reputation of this school, I'll give you a little background about myself, has been a part of my map of the world for probably 50 years. Um, I spent a lot of my growing up years in Enid, Oklahoma, which is just down I-35 and about 30 miles west, uh, where my father was the president of Phillips University. And because of that, the world of small liberal arts colleges in this context was always the topic of discussion at our dinner table. And how precious and important these schools are, this school is, to the education and formation of you all who are here today uh, for lives of service and uh, commitment to the work of good in the world. So it's just a pleasure to be here. And I have to tell you though, um, Although this is my first trip to this uh, school, it is not my first trip to Winfield. And my father didn't know this until I told him on the drive up this morning, but when I was uh, a senior in high school in 1977, I told him I was going to spend the weekend with my friend Lisa, and instead of spending the weekend at her house, we got in a pickup truck and came up here for the Bluegrass Festival. <laughs> And we had a really, really good time. <laughs> and that's all I'll tell them. So. <laughs> uh, what a wonderful festival that is. Um, I also want to say a warm thank you to Brad Andrews for the invitation and for the introduction, uh, and to the Smith-Wilson family for endowing this lectureship. Um, and a special word of gratitude also to um, Jacob Goodson. Um, I'm sure that all of you here know this, 
but he's a truly remarkable scholar and teacher and philosopher. There are few philosophy professors, actually I should say professors in general, who have his unique combination of and a real ability to teach and to make things interesting, an ability to cultivate in students both concern and compassion for the pressing issues of our day. He also has a brilliant mind, and he is a gem of a person. And if you haven't taken a course with him yet, you must. Uh, because the work that he does in the classroom and in his writing is truly life-changing. Thank you, Jake. I'm also very happy to be here uh, today with Linda and Larry Hahn, who are sitting right here in the front row. Um, to say they are good friends of my family is to way understate our relationship. I have known them um, from my church in Richardson, Texas since I was six years old. Um, we have uh, grown up together. Uh, they were my second parents through my youth and to be here in this place with them is an honor for me. Their commitment to this school, to Winfield, to the work of social justice and community engagement, and they're just living committed Christian lives is a remarkable testimony in so many ways. And I thank you for that. I'm so proud that you're here. And then, the last of my thank yous, um, but not the least, I'm very happy, I'm going to get teary about this, um, I'm very happy that my father, the Reverend Dr. Joe R. Jones, was able to drive up with me today from Oklahoma City to hear me give this lecture. It means the world to have him here. Can you even begin to imagine, though, what it would feel like to be giving a lecture in front of your dad? <laughs> so I want to get some sympathy here. <laughs> but as Jacob and the Hans know, he's not just any dad. He's a world-renowned, highly respected theologian whose two-volume work, The Grammar of Faith, is perhaps the most teachable and analytic, sophisticated, and faithfully rendered systematic theology taught in the U.S. today. I would not be standing up here today without his steady, wise guidance and example of what it means to be a Christian. <coughs> an open-hearted soul, an intellectual, and a devoted citizen of this nation. Now imagine growing up with a theologian sitting at your dinner table every night. Jacob, I know your daughter is here. Serafina would be able to identify with this. By age seven, he had taught me and my two sisters to pronounce Kierkegaard and Schleiermacher correctly. And along with these names, we had regular discussions of what it means to live a life grounded in reflection and pursuit of truth. He taught us, our family, that what you believe about God and about humanity, and about the world around you imp impacts everything you do. From how you wake up in the morning, to how you go to sleep at night, to how you interact with every person you meet. How you interact with every person you meet. How you think about a room full of people. How you walk through the park and look at the trees and think about why they are there, and what they are to us. <clears throat> it also impacts how you think about what it means to be an American, a citizen of this great democracy. It's a deeply theological way of being. As a citizen, 
It affects how you understand what it means to love your country, but also to love very concretely your fellow citizens. How to lovingly hold leaders and the people of our nations accountable to the values that founded our country. These are theological dispositions. To live as a citizen, as if you actually believe, and it's tested all the time to see if you're living it, that we are, in fact, all of us, equal. But it's a hard thing to actually live, much less truly confess and believe. That we're all deserving, every single one of us, of respect, and not just respect, but the right to thrive, to have good lives, lives of meaning and purpose. I don't do this very often, but I am going to quote Melania Trump. Uh, when she says, we are called to be best, from my perspective, that means we are called to be moral, to be loving, to be glorious, to be justice-seeking, to be compassionately human. That is what it means to be best. And thank you, Joe Jones, Dad, for your witness, not only for being a great theologian, a great citizen, but also embodying these and being a great dad. I dedicate my talk today to him and to Jacob. By the way, they are good friends. Who, in Jacob, I find the next generation of this remarkable integrity and reflection coming to life yet again. So I say these words about my father, not just because he's here today, although um, that is a good reason to say them, but because this afternoon I want to share with you what I've learned as I have written a book that I've just finished in December that is a theological memoir. When I um, gave the title of this lecture a year ago, the title of that book was going to be What is Truth? What is True? As I began to write the book, however, that title changed. Um, and as your president mentioned, it is now titled Call It Grace. The subtitle is Finding Meaning in a Fractured World. And in writing this book, his theological presence has figured large. The book started when it was entitled Call It Truth, or What is True? The book started as an attempt on my part to write a text that would introduce students, undergraduates, communities like you, to a wide range of older, long dead, and also contemporary theologians who I believe are important to hear about because they say things to us about how to live a good life, how to spiritually thrive in what I describe as incredibly fractious and often frightening times. Fractured world. Now, I probably do not need to explain what I mean by fractious and frightening, but I will anyway. The students who are sitting in here, you are the first generation of students who have had to live with the knowledge that our earth has become so toxic that it may, in large parts of it, no longer be inhabitable in less than a hundred years some parts already becoming uninhabitable. Now, regardless of how each of you feel about the topic of global warming or climate change, each of you, all of us, have had to consider or imagine what the end of humanity and the end of the world looks like, and to imagine it in apocalyptic terms. You can't turn on the television or Netflix or Amazon or whatever it is you watch 
without being overwhelmed, regardless of your opinion on climate change, with stories where people live on an earth where the end of life as we know it has happened. And the earth is a hostile place, physically hostile, living in a context of the collapse of social order, endless movies about what it means to live in a place where there is no more democracy. There is no more church picnics and summer camps and beautiful universities and schools and neighborhoods. A space of desolation where people are struggling simply to survive and learn how to find meaning after the unimaginable and the meaningless has happened. This apocalyptic story, as I describe it, is a deep part of our cultural story. It's a part of our imaginations. <clears throat> Whether or not you actually believe it as a fact or it's a part of what rumbles around inside of you, it is there as something your generation has taken in and lives in response to. Your generation, wrestling with this, has shown signs, and we, all of us, see it clearly, of the growing anxiety that this story of desolation cultivates in them, raising questions about what does one make of one's life in such a context. It's no accident that levels of mental illness, isolation, along with levels of substance abuse, the opioid crisis we hear so much about, are escalating out of control across the country, we're also living in a moment where the question when you're in college of work is becoming deeply problematic. What does it mean to be formed for work in a world where quite literally and moment by moment, second by second, technology is replacing the traditional work that people do? There won't be 50 years from now, 20 years from now, jobs as we have traditionally thought of them. You've also grown up in a world, and this is not the world that I grew up in, but you've grown up in a world where war has become not an unusual event, but a constant reality, a steady state, a fact of life. Global violence, terrorism, domestic terrorism, in the United States, most of the terrorism we experience is from U.S. citizens against U.S. citizens. All of this we have come in your generation simply to think of as par for the course. This is what it means to be human community today. <coughs> we live in fractured times. A desolate sense of the future. Do we call it hopeless times? And yet, this is not to say, and I need to say this very loudly and clearly right at the beginning, that each day in all of our lives, we wake up in the morning and go to sleep at night with a sense of enormous gratitude in our hearts as it moves across the heaven, we watch the sun and celebrate its presence. As the wind blows across the prairie, we feel the bracing sense of what it means to be alive. The joy of friendship, as precious as it is, continues to press itself upon our hearts and souls. Care that we receive from strangers. And the humorous delight of simply being a human being in this very messed up world is something that continues to delight us. That is there too, and it is no small thing. Now, to this book, College Grace. As I said, I wanted originally to write about how theology can help us live and thrive in the midst of these forces of diminishment. 
And the book started off pretty abstract. I did things like describe who Kierkegaard is, who Reinhold Niebuhr is, who John Calvin was, who Karl Barth, these names may sound familiar if you've taken philosophy and theology courses. I approached the book the way many theologians from my seminary, Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, have done so for now almost two centuries. Union is known around the world for being the place where the theologians do what's called public theology. There's no greater list of, quote, public theologians in the world than the list of faculty who have come through my seminary, who have time and again seen the job of philosophy and theology not only to help individuals lead better lives or to get the truth about God straight, but to also speak to the broader culture across the divides of religion and caste and race and class about meaning and truth and how we engage as human beings, our shared public call to live together and to improve our world. That's what they call public theology. Perhaps the most often quoted theologian in the United States today is Reinhold Niebuhr, who taught for over 50 years at Union Theological Seminary. Or for those of you who read theology, the very recently departed James Cone, the founder of Black Liberation Theology, who in the 60s was the first voice to break onto the American <coughs> scene with the insistence that God is not white. And to unfurl and let loose the imagination of Christians in America insisting God is black. What does it mean to imagine that God is black? So I come to Union as the president of this school where public theology is what we pride ourselves in doing, and I, as the first woman, decide, okay, I'm going to write myself a public theology. And I started writing. And I found I couldn't talk about theology and its public import without first telling very ordinary, non-issue focused stories about my life. I began writing about how theology had personally made a difference to me in the tissue of my own daily living. And before I knew it, I had written 12 chapters of what is ostensibly a theological memoir and a public theology at the same time. It's filled with stories about my grandparents, whose parents were Sooners in Oklahoma, my own parents, my father, my two sisters, my marriage and my divorce, my daughter, who's now 22, my surviving cancer, my early travels in India, my high school boyfriend who was killed on a dark highway in Arkansas, coming back from working on an offshore rig, the bombing of the Murrah building in Oklahoma City, and the closeness of one sister to that bombing, and another sister to the execution of Timothy McVeigh. A story about lynching, about race riots, about sexual violence, about a church that was so deeply formative and a church in utter disarray. All of this very personal stuff came pouring out of me as I tried to write this public theology. As theology. It poured out of me as I watched it as theology. And suddenly I realized that, without even thinking about it, this idea that there is this thing called theology, which is a set of statements about God and humanity over here, and this thing over here called real life, are two things that the task of our life is to try to connect. No, in fact, that distance between the two had utterly collapsed. 
And I've come to believe, as I've always espoused, but now believe in my bones with more force than ever, that theology only exists in living form, in the tissue of our daily lives, in our hopes and our fears. Theology only lives in our loves and our hatreds. It only lives in our cruelties and our kindness. It only exists in the tissue of our interactions with people and in the communities where we live and grow, are born, spend our days, and pass away. And I suddenly understood, as I watched this happen to myself, almost despite myself, what it means to talk about incarnation. That at the heart of the Christian message, of I being a Christian theologian, think about quite often, is not a document that lists a bunch of statements about what is true, it's actually a biography. Jesus didn't descend and write pronouncements. We hear the story of someone who was born vulnerable as a baby and who lived with people and had interactions and teaching we hear details about people's sicknesses and their bodies. And it's a very personal story with Jesus as this character at the center of it. And we only know who he is in that story insofar as we witness his interactions with other people. And we hear about where he walks and what he says. He is who he is as Jesus only in the story that his life unfurls. We only know who he is through that life interaction. The Gospels are his biography, his birth, life, death, and story. So today I want to talk just for a few minutes about some of the things that I learned as my focus shift from what is truth to call it grace. And one of the first things that I began to learn was to pay attention when you are reflecting on theology in your own life to those images, those core images that matter the most. And at the very beginning of this book, I found myself writing a story that I had never written about before. I had I talked to my family about it, but it's a story that my grandmother, Ida Bell Seitz, uh, who married my grandfather, Dick Jones, uh, told me when I was a teenager and living with her in Oklahoma City about her first experience of God. Her parents were Sooners. They lined up on the Kansas border, just probably couple miles from here, and when the gun was shot to open what was then called Oklahoma Territory to settlement, um, my grandmother's father, um, Adam Seitz, jumped on a white Arabian horse he had sold his farm to buy and rode across the plains as fast as he could to get to a plot of land where he pulled the stake out of the ground with a flag on it took it to Enid to register in the Garfield County Registrar's Office and came back to Missouri to get Effie, his wife, fill up a small wagon with their few possessions and go out into the middle of an empty space of prairie and start a new life. For them, that was hope. I tell the story about my great-grandmother getting off that wagon and looking literally at, you know this because you live around here, parched earth, <laughs> as hard as concrete. She gets out of the wagon. She puts her hands on her hip. And she says, well, Adam, this is a bit more than I bargained for. <laughs> My grandma tells a story that they stood there staring at each other. You can imagine that wind blowing around. And she walked back to the wagon and pulled out the cast iron skillet and started making dinner. So my grandma tells this story. She tells a story of her earliest memory of being out in one of those fields that they had to turn from concrete into fields where wheat would grow. She remembers lying underneath a wagon in the shade 
looking out and seeing her parents with the plow over their shoulders and the uh, piece of metal going through the dirt, struggling forward. They had left her under the wagon because it was so hot, and she looks up, and hanging from the base of the wagon is a canteen, an old metal jug. And she, in her ragged cotton dress, or I can imagine her son's skin, her, her skin sunburn, reaches up and wraps herself around that canteen, that cool water. <laughs> cooling her young body. She said to me, that was when I knew who God was. Cool water. And I never wanted to let go. I never wanted to let go again. And then my grandma looked at me and she says, that's grace. A water jug filled with cool water in the heat of summer. Life-giving nurturing, invigorating, <coughs> life. So I've carried this story with me all these years. When I am asked to say what I mean by grace, when I say call it grace, I tell that story. And that canteen comes back to me. Grace, quite simply, is the word we use to refer in theological conversation to the love of God. The love of God that is given to us for the sole purpose of sustaining and embracing us. Without us having to earn it, without us having to do anything to require it, it is simply there for the sake of our thriving. Amen. That is grace. It's a pretty wild concept in today's world in which we have to learn how to merit everything and to earn every inch of what we have. Oh, yes. But there it sits, right at the center of theology. A concept of something. A reality of something. A canteen of cool water that comes to us regardless of who we are or what we've done. Yeah. <clears throat> Simply for the purpose that we might thrive and that love might embrace us. Transform us, change us, open us up to the world and to each other. The interesting thing about grace is it's there even if you don't see it. And it's there. That love is coming. That canteen is hanging there even if you happen to walk away from it. It simply is the nature of divine love. There's another story, and I'll tell this one more quickly, that also comes to me from my junior high years. That was central to the writing of this book and stands right next to this story about grace. And this is when I was at church camp, Disciples of Christ Church Camp in Guthrie, Oklahoma. There's a cragged old piece of earth by a receding lake. This, this, this notion of dry parched earth comes up a lot in my book, I realize it's a, it's a common theme. And I'm sitting there with all of my church group and we're singing, it's 19, uh, 72, and we're singing all of the songs you can imagine from that day, or many of you probably cannot imagine from that day. I think we began with the story of the song One Tin Soldier uh, from the movie Billy Jack, and then we moved on to Blowing in the Wind. Um, all of these songs captured this sense of turmoil in the country, but also this winsome, powerful sense of young hope. And then uh, the guitar player, uh, with his long beard, um, started playing a song we all know well from Woody Guthrie, This Land is Your Land. And we sang along for four verses, knowing everything, having sung it in school. And then he got to a verse that no one had ever heard. And he sang, I saw my people standing by the steeple in the welfare lines they were standing by the steeple. And I found myself asking, is this land made for you and me? And then he sang another verse I had never heard before. And I went walking and saw a sign there. And on the front side, it said private property. And on the back side, it said just nothing. That side 
was made for you and me. Beautiful verses. Powerful verses about who we are as a nation and what we still face in our country today. And yet they had been lopped off. I remember feeling so angry that afterwards I went up to the guitar player and I said, why is it I've never heard those verses before? Did you make those up? That's a little precocious kid there. Um, and he said, no. And that's when he said to me, our country doesn't want us to sing those songs. Then I felt embarrassed that I'd asked such a question. But it was then that I began to realize that part of the struggle of living in grace is having enough strength in that love to not have to only tell nice stories, but to actually tell the truth about our lives. And so a big theme in this book is not just grace, but what we all commonly refer to as sin, but it's also sin in the sense of the broken parts of our lives that we recoil from, that we press down, that we want to hide, that we think will make the world better if we simply don't touch those places. There's many stories I can tell you in this book about how this relationship between recognizing the unmerited, unlimited, all-embracing love of God as the deepest truth about who we are on the one hand, and recognizing on the other hand that simultaneous we are human beings who are capable of enormous harm. We are capable of being deluded and distorted in our thinking. We are capable of hatred and cruelty, not just in big forms, but in small forms. And it is impossible to live a life as a human being anywhere on this earth and not be implicated in all of those systems of brokenness as they swirl around us and through us. What does it mean to live your life as if these two things are simultaneously true about you, about your neighbors, and about the world in which you find yourself? It means you have to develop a kind of double vision that's constantly focused on the world through two lenses. The grace lens is the one that ultimately wins, but the sin lens needs to always be sharply focused or you can't see humanity and the world for what it truly is. And that seems like a simple pairing, a, a double vision that we develop. But when it comes to the telling of American history, when it comes to the telling of our own personal stories, we're not very good at it. And that's why in this book, I dig back into my own family's history, my own family's past, and I come to some surprising, indeed shocking, realizations about the sins of America, the sins of whiteness, the sins of my family, and the sins that travel as a legacy into my life today. One particular story comes to mind. I was still at uh, Yale Divinity School as a professor, and I was leading a search for a professor of African American studies, and as the head of the search committee, I was in charge of introducing the speaker and then sitting on the front row and leading the discussion afterwards. And a wonderful scholar, Anthony Penn, had come to present. And behind him, as he spoke, were a series of slides that were postcards, pictures of postcards that had been taken at the turn of the century of lynching. There they were on the screen, larger than life, this size, just slowly falling one after another as he spoke. Mostly they were scenes of horrible <coughs> violence surrounded by people having parties. And I remember looking at these scenes and thinking, this is American history, this is horrible, and then bam, a postcard dropped down. And it was a woman. And she had been lynched, and she was in her Sunday best clothes. And at the bottom of the postcard, it said, Okima, Oklahoma, 1911. I wanted to throw up. 
Suddenly, all of this knowledge I had about Jim Crow America and the 300 year history of chattel slavery and Jim Crow, the most sophisticated system of torture, a system set up to physically extract labor from an enslaved people, suddenly all of that came crashing in upon me as a deeply close and personal reality in 1911 Okima, Oklahoma was where my grandfather Dick Jones lived. He was six years old. His family made up probably half the town in one way or another. The population was 600. There was no way my grandfather and his family did not at least know about that lynching and more likely than not were witnesses to it. My family. I grew up in the home of a civil rights activist who put his life on the line time and again, and yet my grandfather had never told that story to my father. My grandfather had never spoken to me or to my father or to anyone in my family about the Tulsa race riots. Where over 3,000 homes, it was an American Holocaust. My Jewish professor in college used this word to describe it poured turpentine from airplanes over neighborhoods of African Americans and burned them out. I never heard the stories of the race riots that took place in Oklahoma. I never heard the stories of almost 300 lynchings that happened in a 10 year period after Jim Crow law slammed down on the state in 1910 and changed everything. You had to sign papers saying that you were white if you wanted to own property in certain towns like Okima. And my grandfather, who was proud of his Cherokee heritage, signed that paper saying he was white so he could own his home, his, my grandfather's father. And so goes the legacies of race in our country. And I learned more about this woman, Laura Nelson, who was dragged from her home not only by herself but with her 14-year-old son and her six-month-old baby in her arms who was laid down on the bridge right before they threw her and her son off the bridge to lynch them. And the reason the picture had been turned into a postcard is because the local photographer in town had come in his boat early the next morning and anchored it in the middle of the river so that he could get shots of the bodies. And when you look at the full postcard, which I did, you pull back from the scene of her and you see on the bridge above the bodies what looks like hundreds of people from Okima gathered, waving, children on the hips of mothers, picnic baskets in hand, like it's the 4th of July. And I looked at this picture and I thought, these are my people. This is the story of whiteness in America. And it's a story that white people don't talk about. Yep. When we talk about race in America, we quickly turn to stories of the formerly enslaved African Americans, to Latinos, but we never talk about the very close histories in our own families of the making of whiteness in America. James Baldwin has a wonderful quote where he says, when the Swedes showed up in the United States to settle here, they weren't yet white. But when they got to America, they were made white. With the same force that slavery was created and imprinted on the black bodies of enslaved Africans, so too whiteness, with the capacity it has for torture and cruelty, was stamped upon the racial identity of white people. It became the skeletal structure of whiteness. You have to learn, and I actually believe this, it comes deep from my faith, that human beings are not naturally cruel and evil. You have to learn, you have to create a culture that is capable of making people, white people, able to inflict the kind of horror that they inflicted on the bodies of enslaved people and through Jim Crow. You have to make people, you have to teach them 
how to lynch. You have to make them white. And that legacy of whiteness is something that every white person in this room has a relationship to. I could go on about this, it's much to talk about, but I had a remarkable experience this summer. I was giving a lecture in Kansas City. It was the first time I publicly told this story, not in anywhere near the detail that I told it today. But I talked about the need for us in the United States, empowered by grace and yet seeing and feeling and knowing our implication in sin, to tell this story, to tell the truth about our past as white people. And after I gave the lecture, I had a line of probably six older white men, most of them in their 70s, two of them in their 80s, come up to me and with tears in their eyes, tell me stories they had never told before. One spoke of a neighbor that his father knew had murdered a black man and buried in their backyard. Another told me that he knew that his great-grandparents had been plantation owners and his own grandfather, one of the worst. And another told me a story of a cruelty he committed in college. And there it was, all of this, like my own theological memoir pouring out of me, was a history of whiteness in America, the locked off part, pouring out. And these men had so much shame that they had never spoken these truths. But until they do that, we can't move forward. We can't move forward. We can do so, empowered by grace, we can do so with sin ever before us. And this is your moment. You, you students, your generation has to force that story out. Amen. Because we cannot move forward as a country until it is forced out. And that story has to be laid out before us and we have to repent. We have to make reparations. We have to see it for what it is if there is to be life other than desolation beyond it. One of my favorite poems I'll end with captures this as not just a process that is painful and filled with suffering and the truth telling, but a process that ultimately leads to the hope that we reach towards. You can hear the water breaking, the frozen ice of centuries, the rumble of that ice breaking forth and rolling across the land. But it is not just the rumble of death, it is the rumble of life, where we stand at a moment in time when all the harms of the past have come up to grasp us, and they will not let us go until we, until we take the greatest stride that humanity has ever taken. And we step into the reality of grace. Thank you. Time for your questions, and I ask if you're at, if you're sitting near the end of your aisle to come on forward. If you're if you're sitting in the middle and you want to ask a question, I'll I'll try to listen well and repeat it for everyone. Uh, but so you can start to form a line if you wish to ask questions. I do want to a rule that Dr. Lacey and I like to have at these lectures is that students get the first question. We're the first questions if there's enough students. <laughs> Um, so you can start to get someone come up, to, come up with the courage to come up here. Um, while I'm waiting on the first question, you can sign in for Dr. Goodson and Dr. Lacher's courses at this point. Um, 
the sign-in sheets are in the lobby by the cookies. So sign in and grab a cookie. <laughs> and it's two classes for you, Dr. Lynch. Okay. All right. Who, who has the first question? is how long have you been writing the book? Well, um, it begins before I was born with my grandmother's story, so I guess I was writing it for generations, but I actually um, worked on it for three years. It was a, a very much a process of, of a discovery of my own self. Um, and uh, of the many things that I learned, I know I put it very forcefully today, but of the many things that I learned, and I want to, I want to hear from you whether this, you know, rings true for you, but that, um, that white people need to talk about whiteness. That when we talk about racism in this country, there is a story that needs to be told about the con social construction of whiteness and how it comes down to us for generations the traumas it holds within us, and, and what it means to break free from that. We need to shift the conversation rather dramatically. But it's very hard to do. Does that, does that part ring true for you all? Given that religion is so integral in our lives, um, where do you think would be the best place to start for this work that you're suggesting? Well, ideally, it would start in our religious communities. Um, and at Union Theological Seminary, uh, this is something that we are diving into. One of the things that we have been talking about a lot lately is the whole concept of implicit bias. Um, and implicit bias, there's a lot of sociological and psychological literature on it, but it's the it's the reactions and the predispositions that we carry in our bodies that affect profoundly how we make decisions and how we interact with each other. But they're not conscious to us. They're unconscious and yet they're extremely determinative of how we act. So it's been very helpful at Union for the faculty, staff, and students to go through training in implicit bias because it helps people understand that what I'm referring to today is, as the construction of race and. In, in, in my case, the construction of whiteness, um, it helps you understand how um, these long legacies live in you even in ways that you are not conscious of. You're born into them. You're taught them from the moment you're born. I, I tell a story about my own daughter um, and the construction of, of being a woman. That it, what she wasn't, she hadn't been alive but 30 seconds before someone plopped a pink hat on her head. And after that moment, she was a girl. And everyone interacted with her like she was a girl, and it wasn't even something she had to think about being. And, and that's the same way uh, racial constructions function, but until we stop and think about those things we don't know about who we are in our unconscious lives, it's very often hard to get at that deep stuff, because particularly uh, people who are liberal uh, like to think they've gotten over all of this. Of course I'm beyond this, you know? I'm a liberal, white, Protestant, seminary president of a progressive school in Manhattan. Of course I've gone beyond whiteness and the brutality of whiteness and the dynamics of race in this country. So, so that, that implicit bias discussion is one way, I think, into this. Um, and then churches need to be uh, brave enough to have these discussions. Our schools need to be having them. You know, it's not at all, um, it's not shocking, but yet when you think about it in the broader context, it, it's shocking that when you look back on modern history 
and the horrors that have been inflicted by communities and groups of people. You've watched the process that Germany went through um, to deal with the horrors of the Holocaust. Still, the upsurgence of nationalism and Nazism in Germany today is, is troubling, but they went through a process of confessing the horrors of what had happened. You look at apartheid in South Africa when it fell and what it meant for the truth and reconciliation for all of its shortcomings, the truth and reconciliation hearings, tried to tell a story of what had happened so that the nation, struggling as it still is, could move forward without a cloud of secrecy over the past. And these are horrors compared to the 300 years of slavery in Jim Crow that were, compared to that, short-lived. And yet, in, we have never had a public conversation about what it means to repair the breach, the harm, that that 300 years inflicted upon the body of this place. Right. Silence. We have a museum you can go learn about the details of slavery, but that's very different in the public conversation about what it means to, to heal a wound that has never been touched. I agree with you that uh, it should start in the churches. As a retired pastor, however, I'm very aware that it is as entrenched in our congregations as it is in the general public. And that the power is there to take clergy's jobs away from them when they speak up, as well as others who are staff members or whatever in the church, leaders in the church who want to make sure that we deal with this. My, my question is, how do we begin to break down what is probably one-third of this country's entrenchment uh, against talking about our own responsibility uh, in, ending, uh, in ending the prejudice and the hatred and all of that. So I have two responses, and because I, I live in Manhattan and I don't live here, I get to say sort of outrageous things and then leave. So, um, um, that one thing to think about with respect to the church is that, you know, at this point in time, the church, what does the church have to lose? And what is there to protect? I mean, the, the church's membership is declining dramatically. It, it, it doesn't have the level of cultural relevance. It's not an institution that can claim glory and power. Um, even most evangelicals don't associate with the congregation. And so we really are at a point in thinking about church life in America where there is an open space to, to try to move forward in ways that we have felt particularly bound from in the past because we have nothing to lose. Um, uh, the second thing I would say is that, you know, it's very easy, uh, particularly in this fractured political context, to... <coughs> When you think about something like um, racism in America and white supremacy, to say, oh, well, this group of people are the white supremacists, and this is the group of people who are white that have gotten over it and are now doing all the right things. And it's, in fact, not the case that that's the way it's divided up. And what I find in the writing of this book myself, um, as a liberal, um, that when I began to dig into my own history, I realized that wasn't the case. That it was right there in my own family. And I think getting a of uh, uh, people and congregations in thinking about the history of race in America to just simply do some genealogical work to, to say where where was your family in six in 1850 where was your family uh, when wherever they were living at the time when Jim Crow descended what did they do during emancipation and just start collecting the stories pardon oh I heard something well, first off, thank you for sharing, uh, giving us an image of what truth telling looks like, you know, um, through intimate stories that you didn't have to tell. I'm grateful that you did. 
Um, I'm very taken by that image of truth, actually. Um, that I wrote in my notes as you were talking that um, just a, a thought that came to mind is truth has no power unless it is uncovered, unless it is told, um, unless it feels or legs, if you will. Um, but I'm curious, how does, sorry, how does that, uh, how does that affect, how does this image of truth telling as you're, as you're describing it affect how, regardless of where we on, are on the theological spectrum, either left or right, um, how does that affect how we um, engage with think ideas like gospel? Um, how does this image of truth telling change how we communicate the gospel, for instance? I'm curious for all the ministers and, and religion students in the room what you'd say to that. Um, well, this is why the gospels are so interesting. Is they, um, they tell the truth by just telling a story about how people interact and the horrible and the good things they do to each other. Um, and in that context, the truth is not a, an abstract proposition. It's a, it's a story about human interactions that are both broken and, and healing. Um, and it's the same with grace. You know, if, if, if someone were to ask me what I think is most true about the world, I would say grace. I would say the one thing that is unquestionable in my mind is the reality that um, our ultimate destiny as human beings is lies within the love of God. That's true. And it's true even if we don't know it. And in that sense, that's a truth that is true even if it's never spoken. It's nonetheless true. That's God's love. But it becomes much more transformative in our lives if we open our eyes to it and live as if we're beloved. But so there's always this balance between truth that is true even if it's never spoken and yet the power of speaking in terms of actual transformation. But we don't have in our non-speaking the power to negate the love of God. That theology and philosophical answer. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for more questions. Isn't it part of the arrogance of the conqueror to feel like this isn't something I really need to worry about? That's their problem. What my great grandparents did, it's their problem. No, so I heard that, yes, and I, and I hear that all the time, and I hear that, um, um, I hear that across the board um, from people, no matter where they are on the political spectrum, I, I hear it most painfully from um, um, progressive white people who will say, well, yes, my great-grandparents did that, but I've gotten over it, and that, that happened in the past. But the fact of the matter is, is that we still live in a society that is deeply marked by that reality. Look at us. We still live in that history. And as Reinhold Niebuhr and others have said, if you don't tell the truth about history, you're destined to repeat it. Amen. And so it's not gone. It's not back there. It's here now. It's here being reenacted every time a young black man is shot in the streets. It's here being reenacted with the collapse of our public school systems, racially segregated in ways that were even unimaginable in the 60s. It's here as we see the collapse of the healthcare system. It's here as we see in the, just in terms of what we could talk about, in the collapse of 2008. The African American community as a whole, who historically has invested its assets in the ownership of property, lost 80% of its net worth compared to the white community, which suffered about a 26% loss. That is the reality of what we are still living in today. A setback, dramatic setback for one community and for, uh, for another, not without harm, but a recoverable blip in the economic story told. So it's, it's not back there. So uh, I agree with you in the sense where to solve an issue, you first must acknowledge to uh, to admit there is an issue. 
but I feel personally in a country where uh, opinions are looked at before facts, it would be a little difficult to uh, distribute facts and counter-argue with facts without hurting someone's opinion. And uh, as we learned in Goodson's class, uh, everyone is entitled to their opinion, and sometimes people do not want to go against their opinion. So I guess my question to you would be, how do we go about, how do we go about, um, how do we go about addressing this issue without, you know, getting our facts and then without hurting opinions, you know, and avoiding conflict? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean that that's a, a that's a good question, and anybody who's a pastor has to deal with that all the time. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're in a congregation that has the differences that I've been describing today in all their different forms in your congregation. You know, how do you jump into these complexities and not immediately alienate people so they can't have the conversation? Um, what's been helpful to me is. Um, to, when reflecting on these issues, to realize that um, even though it's submerged, um, the pain and the hurt and the violence and the conflict that we need to be addressing and changing is already there. And that even though we can't see it, maybe in the immediate moment, people are dying and have been for a long time. And that there is enormous violence and conflict happening at that very moment, but it's outside the frame of our immediate space. And so, um, again, I find myself that storytelling is, is a good way to open up those spaces that we don't see because they're outside the frame of the usual story we tell ourselves about our lives. Um, and that's a way to bring other voices and feelings and experiences into the conversation. Um, not so that you, uh, you know, obliterate someone else, uh, but so that you, uh, if we could view dialogue and conversation as a way of opening space, uh, rather than, you know, contesting space. I'm sure that your professor has uh, talked about these kinds of things about conversation, dialogue, and storytelling in your class, but I can sit up here and talk about it, but it's much harder on the ground, especially when people don't want to listen. They don't actually care about those stories or what a fact is. <laughs> I had a postcard. I had a postcard. Talk about a fact. I had a postcard. And there was something about taking that to my father and my family and saying, look, I have a postcard. Let's find that story. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to say this, but I guess as white people, we not only spread the love against black people, but we're also now doing it to the brown race, you know, so it doesn't stop, right? All the people coming across the border from Mexico and Central America, so we, yeah. we have this, this capacity to, uh, to ruin other people's lives also, not just black people, but now also brown people, Native Americans. So uh, as white people, we just really seem to mess it up, I guess. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that honestly because it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful. It's shameful. We all should be crying the way we're treating people. And you're absolutely right that as, as I talked about the construction of that whiteness that began in, in the making of the United States, that whiteness needed to be able to, as James Baldwin put it, the country needed to create, in particular, men who were capable of going into a Native American village and bringing it to the ground and raping the women. 
That's not a natural thing for people to do. They had to learn how to do that. They had to learn how to do that by, by turning, based on the color of the skin, people into non-humans. And that has extended into the way reality has been constructed in the United States since the start with that, that, those acts of violence. But one of the things I think that is important to add to this conversation is that construction that makes, that is so brutal, um, is actually also destroying white people. It's not, it's not, it's not a healthy way to exist in the world. And it's eating, it's eating the white community up inside until, until it changes. It's, de it's destruction is pervasive. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but the um, most recent APA study on men and boys, the 10-year study on the health of men in the United States, um, boys and men, and it basically looks at suicide rates, um, violence, murder rates, um, uh, abuse rates, um, it looks at drug use, it looks at alcoholism, it looks at all of the major illnesses, and, um, and men in general are shooting off the charts in terms of uh, their mortality rates. It's, it's going down very rapidly, um, and basically I think what this report says in one way or another is we are seeing the implosion in the bodies of our construction of American masculinity, uh, which is very much tied to the construction of that whiteness that happened at the beginning. And I mean, it, it's crumbling, um, but it, it's, it's, um, it, is, it is a curse and a construction that's not only um, deadly for those who are othered by it, but it's deadly for those who hold it within themselves. And that's the way we need to be talking about it. That's why I find people will call it sin. I'm going to pick up there and ask you a final question. Um, how can someone else have a question? Oh, yeah. Where do we go for more? If we're, right, if we're wanting to learn more about how to keep having these conversations or to keep trying to be better grace-filled human beings, what do we do next? Well, you guys are doing it here already I mean, on this campus and finding the people who are working together on this. I know these classes are good spaces. I'm sure there's many more, but you know, there's never a time like college uh, to find communities where you can actually begin to develop friendships and closeness and ties that can sustain you over time as you, as you leave this place and have the space to think creatively and push against the walls and the boundaries and ask questions and, and reimagine things. We need your imagination. We need, as college students, we need your poetry. We need your stories. We need your vision of the future. Yeah. And let it roll. Let it come out and wrestle with it. Make it beautiful. Okay, one final question for me. How can, what is your advice for those of us that teach and write for a living? How can we develop those lenses and help our readers and our students develop those lenses of sin and grace? That's what I can. That's the skill that I feel like I really lack, is the, the sin and grace simultaneously. What is your, what is your advice for that? Well, you know, anyone who thinks about their own life honestly doesn't have a very hard time. I mean, I'm not saying you don't think about your life honestly. <laughs> yeah, yes, okay, so Jacob is an example. You have him stand up on stage, you know, but if you think about your life honestly and you think about these questions, it's actually existentially not very hard to see that we're simultaneously capable of enormous goodness and love and yet horrible cruelty and brokenness and they just exist right there in us. And the thing that's hard to realize is that that's in everybody, not just you, or not just the person you think is really bad. It's across the board. Sin is a great equalizer, as is grace. I mean, democracy is founded on a notion of original sin, which assumes we need checks and balances because people are prone to corruption. 
And we need to make everybody equal and give them a vote because people are prone to corruption. Democracy is the hedge against human sin. If you get enough voices in the room of different opinions, and somehow the belief was you could fend off those powers of corruption and stop power from being centralized in the hands of a single community because nobody escapes sin and it, you don't want to get concentrated sin of one sort having dominance over the nation. So, um, yeah. So I think as a professor, I've always had to be very clear with my own students, which I'm sure you are because I, I have heard enough about you, but that even being a professor is not about being the smartest one or the most perfect one in the room. It's about being the one who has been called to help people learn. And sometimes you're going to do it well, and sometimes you're going to mess up and learn. Thank you very much.